In the summer of 1971, I departed my home in Georgia for what would become an epic journey to the West, a sojourn from which I have yet to return. Along the way, I visited some of the same sites seen by Francis Parkman when he passed that way 125 years before me. At the time, I had just completed a year's work for pre-med at the University of Georgia, but I was thinking of switching to the study of military history instead. I was also interested in Native American cultures, but I had never considered making that topic my career. In the summer of 1846, Francis Parkman, a Bostonian destined to become one of the greatest historians of the 19th century, left home for an adventurous journey to the West. Departing St. Louis on April 18, 1846, he traveled to Fort Laramie and from there chartered a course toward the Black Hills of what is now eastern Wyoming, and then on to the Rocky Mountains. Along the way, Parkman was befriended by a band of Goglala Sioux, with whom he spent much of the summer. While with the Sioux, Parkman accompanied Oglala warriors on a raid against the Crow, traditional enemies of the Sioux. With none of the Crow to be found, the war party spent the remainder of summer hunting buffalo. Upon his return to Boston, Parkman wrote about his experiences in his well-known account, The Californian Oregon Trail, known today by the shorter title, The Oregon Trail. The further west I traveled, the more of Native America I discovered, just as Francis had that summer in 1846. I found pueblos both occupied and in ruins, spectacular burial mounds and earthworks, trading posts full of old pawn, intertribal powwows that were underway and welcoming, spectacular rock art occurrences located right beside the road, and history museums, some grand and others decrepit. Although I was traveling lightly, I carried several books along to read, including a hardback cover of Dee Brown's recently published book, Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee. As I snaked my way across the continent, following the sun forever westward, I read Brown's book from cover to cover. Of all the stories told in that book, the one that resonated most with me was the tragic story of what befell the Lakota at Wounded Knee in 1890. It reminded me of the terrible massacre that had occurred at My Lai in Vietnam in 1968, an incident which had just made the news a little more than a year earlier. The images of the butchered Vietnamese women and children that had run in the newspapers were still vivid in my mind, and now I could envision Lakota women and children too. In the months leading up to my journey, much of the news had been focused on Lieutenant William Calley's trial. Lieutenant Kelly had been one of the officers in charge at My Lai that dreadful day when over 500 Vietnamese civilians had been slaughtered. Even as I was driving west and reading Dee Brown's book along the way, I couldn't listen to the news without hearing mention of Lieutenant Kelly and My Lai. Every time I heard a news report on my car radio, I thought of Wounded Knee. I couldn't get the picture of the injustice done at Wounded Knee out of my mind. I carried that image with me for the remainder of my journey, and perhaps I carry it still. By the time I arrived in California, I had decided to become an anthropologist. Four decades later, I visited Wounded Knee with my nine-year-old son. It warmed my heart to watch him enter the cemetery with a Lakota elder, and then to recite a prayer for the dead in the Lakota language. I felt as if my journey to the West had finally been completed. Mm -hmm.